Thank you everyone for joining us today to discuss um, state's impact of the New Skills for Youth initiative. My name is Brianna. I'm a policy associate at Advanced CTE. Today we will discuss the state role in transforming and expanding career pathways through looking at the key lessons learned through the New Skills for Youth initiative. And we'll hear from Kentucky and Massachusetts about the work that they accomplished under this initiative. And then we'll close out with a brief Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or chat box. To help me unpack this topic, we'll hear from Kylie Whitaker, who is the Assistant Director of the Division of Technical Schools and Continuous Improvement at the Office of Career and Technical Education and Student Transitions at the Kentucky Department of Education. We will also hear from Carrie Occasion, who is the Career Development Education Lead at the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So the New Skills for Youth initiative was launched by J.P. Morgan Chase & Co. in 2016, and it is a $75 million five-year initiative aimed at strengthening and expanding high-quality career pathways for youth. As part of this initiative, the Council of Chief State School Officers, Advanced CTE, and Education Strategy Group worked with states to improve their career, career readiness systems. The initiative consisted of two phases. During phase one, which ran from March 2016 through October 2016, 24 states and Washington, D.C. conducted a career readiness needs assessment and developed action plans to expand opportunities to learners. In October 2016, these states presented their action plans to a panel of experts who selected a cohort of 10 states. Um, this cohort consisted of Delaware, Kentucky, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Nevada, Ohio, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, Tennessee, and Wisconsin. And the states in the cohort re received an additional $2 million to implement their plans over uh, three years. So during phase two, which ran from January 2017, through December 2019, these 10 states work to put their plans into action and bring about a transformation of their career readiness systems. Specifically, during New Skills for Youth, these 10 states took action to develop and scale high quality career pathways, expand access to work-based learning opportunities, strengthen data and accountability to incentivize career readiness, and lay the foundation for sustainability. States have a clear role in developing and expanding access to high quality career pathways. While each state and in the initiative can point to effective local models prior to the initiative, New Skills for Youth gave states the opportunity to learn from quote unquote islands of excellence and set an expectation for quality statewide. One of the key lessons from New Skills for Youth is that states can and should set the minimum expectations for quality career pathways by defining the non-negotiables and aligning policy accordingly. Outlining critical quality elements in a framework or rubric gives local leaders guidance and vision and allows state leaders to help them meet the bar. Another critical lesson from New Skills for Youth is that states must ensure equity and access at the design stage and actively take steps to remove systemic barriers that prevent learners from accessing, succeeding in, and feeling welcome in high quality career pathways. During phase one of the New Skills, for Youth, New Skills for Youth initiative, states conducted a wholesale evaluation of their enrollment and performance data to identify patterns of inequities across student subgroups. Based on this analysis, states worked to embed equity and program approval criteria, launch new funding to close equity gaps, deliver equity-focused professional development to school leaders and counselors, and more. Additionally, while local leaders implement and deliver career pathways, states can strengthen the quality and fidelity of these programs by providing technical assistance in professional development, fostering state and local partnerships, and building awareness and gaining buy-in. A common approach that states took to support local implementation was, designing, was designating regional coordinators to broker partnerships, coordinate activities, and provide technical assistance and training to support local career pathways. A state that took this approach was Tennessee. Tennessee hired and trained nine regional coordinators to support the planning and delivery of high quality career pathways in each of its nine regions. The coordinators serve as the main points of contact for K-12 schools, post-secondary institutions, and industry leaders in their regions and are responsible for helping schools and districts apply for and receive career pathway certification. 
Additionally, coordinators also work with the regional directors from the Department of Economic and Community Development, the Department of Labor and Workforce Development, regional CTE consultants, and local employers to identify priority labor market needs and align career pathways with high skill, high wage, and demand opportunities. While the Board of Regents serves as the employer record for career pathway coordinators, the coordinators are funded, managed, and trained through the Department of Education, which ensures that the governance of the coordinators spans both the secondary and post-secondary system. The New Skills for Youth states also focus on expanding access to work-based learning opportunities. Work-based learning allows learners to develop the real-world skills they need to be successful in their careers. States can play a an important role in creating the conditions for work-based learning to thrive. One key lesson from New Skills for Youth is that states have a responsibility to set the bar for high-quality work-based learning. Through New Skills for Youth, many states work to identify and define the conditions for quality and, an, and to enact policy, develop standards, and disseminate resources to help local leaders with implementation. An important condition for quality is that work-based learning experiences should be aligned with learners' career pathways so that they, they reinforce and apply classroom learning. Another strategy for expanding access to work-based learning opportunities is setting up and supporting intermediaries at the state, regional, or local level to coordinate between employers and educators and broker opportunities for learners. Finally, for work-based learning to truly happen at scale, state leaders need to focus on equity so that each learner who wants to can access and fully participate in these experiences. Recognizing that states' approaches to work-based learning opportunities can exclude historically marginalized populations, some of the selected New Skills for Youth states piloted work-based learning programs tailored specifically to meet the needs of students with disabilities. To expand access to work-based learning for students with disabilities, Louisiana piloted the Building Employment Skills for Tomorrow, also known as BEST program, in 2018. Learners in the program are connected virtually to industry mentors, mainly adults with disabilities who are successful in the workplace, and engage in work-based learning or school-based enterprises. Specifically, learners in the program receive five to 10 hours weekly of work-based learning opportunities in the community, and two to three hours weekly of career exploration, work readiness training, self-advocacy training, independent living training, and post-secondary comprehensive counseling. States also focus on strengthening their accountability systems to incentivize learners' career readiness throughout the New Skills for Youth um, initiative. One of the most powerful levers to incentivize career readiness is data and accountability. What gets Measured matters, and if schools and districts know they will be held accountable for the number of learners who complete, who complete a career pathway, finish a work-based learning experience, or earn an industry-recognized credential, they will prioritize those opportunities. One of the critical lessons learned through New Schools for Youth is the importance of clearly defining and constructing career readiness indicators. States should consider how their career readiness measures are weighted in the accountability system and monitor implementation to ensure that, that it does not create perverse incentives. States should also share disaggregated data on student performance to demonstrate the myriad of ways students can achieve career readiness. Additionally, states should consider how indicators of career readiness, such as participation in and completion of dual enrollment, industry-recognized credentials, and work-based learning experiences align to the student's career pathways. Another key lesson learned during the initiative is the importance of improving data and accountability by integrating career readiness data into a centralized statewide student information system. This integration not only makes selecting and reporting career readiness measures easier, but it also breaks down silos between agencies and ensures that state policymakers can more readily access information about student participation and success in career readiness. A state that focused on this is Wisconsin. In 2017, the Wisconsin Legislature passed Act 59, which directed the Department of Public Instruction to collect and report specific measures of career readiness in state report cards. To accomplish, this, to accomplish this, the department began to integrate career readiness data into its statewide student information system, which is called WiseDash. Previously, only districts that received funds under Perkins 4 reported data to the department, and they reported only on CTE concentrators. However, given um, this new law and also the state's efforts to integrate um, career readiness data into its student information system, all districts participate in WiseDash, which greatly expands access to and understanding of student participation and outcomes for these particular career readiness indicators. 
Throughout New Skills for Youth, states remained focused on creating sustainable conditions for long-term success. One way for state leaders to lay the foundation for sustainability is by working to establish a vision and to bring together diverse stakeholders in support of a common goal. A number of states leverage existing goals, such as post-secondary credential attainment goals, to provide direction and clarity to their agencies and align different programs, services, and stakeholders. With a strong vision in place, state leaders can work to establish a policy infrastructure that reinforces and supports local career pathways. Additionally, setting practice into policy through legislation, executive orders, and regulations can give the education and workforce development systems the support needed to sustain their efforts and withstand changes in leadership. Importantly, funding through the New Skills for Youth Initiative gave states a low-stakes environment to pilot new models and programs. As the initiative comes to a close, states now have tested models that they can use to build a case for using taxpayer dollars to sustain career readiness efforts, and many have successfully identified federal and state resources to build upon this work. One approach that states can use to secure sustainable funding is to braid funds across different program areas that have similar goals, which can allow the initiative to continue if one of those sources of funding were to dwindle or come to an end. To encourage the braiding of funds, states can leverage their positions as conveners to gather partners to support their shared vision for career readiness and gain buy-in for the alignment of resources. For instance, Delaware braided funding across state, federal, and philanthropic sources, including New Schools for Youth, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Perkins 4, funds issued under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, Title I, and local sources to implement the Delaware Pathway Strategic Plan. To learn more about the state role in transforming career readiness systems and some of the key lessons from New Skills for Youth, I would encourage you to um, visit the link that you see on this slide. Um, yesterday, Advanced CTE released a series of state snapshots that examine um, states' impact across the entire New Skills for Youth initiative, and as well as a summary that touches on um, and it goes into further detail into some of the key lessons that I discussed. Um, but now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Kylie, who's going to talk about the great work that um, Kentucky did through the New Skills for Youth Initiative. Thank you very much. Uh, so I am Kylie Whitaker with the Department of Education. Um, when, I, when my title shows up as Assistant Director, that doesn't help people understand what I do. So um, I was the New Skills for Youth team lead for Kentucky. I work with dual credits, I work with career pathways, I work with all of the data, I work with AP, I work with career readiness, I do all of the accountability um, for CTE and for state accountability and several other things. And so the, the work that I do touches on all of the things I'm gonna talk about uh, that we did during New Skills for Youth. Uh, just wanna give you that background in case you had questions about uh, what it is exactly I do. With that, um, first thing I wanted to do is just touch on a little bit about Kentucky, just so you know where we're coming from um, and what we have in place here in the state to better understand how we were able to move forward with some of this work. So the first thing is that um, two thirds of all high school students participate in CTE career pathways in the state of Kentucky. That's huge. I've seen in a lot of states that that percentage is a lot lower, but in Kentucky, it's, it's actually the norm for students to be in CTE. It's really not normal for students to not be in CTE. And so while we say 67% each year participate, that's about 90 something percent of all uh, seniors uh, that when they graduate that have participated in CTE while in high school. And so it's really not normal for kids not to be part of a career pathway here in the state. Uh, the other thing, I wanna give a huge shout out to the Kentucky Center for Statistics I don't know how many of you know about the Kentucky Center for Statistics that we call KY Stats, but they are a premier longitudinal data management system group um, that collects data from K-12, from workforce, from post-secondary, from uh, industry certification vendors to just about everything that you can think of they have in their system, which allows us to do a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about. Um, but more than that, they um, are an agency that's trusted to de-identify all the student data and provide aggregate numbers to us so that we can combine all of the data together and make sense of what's happening with the programs that we have in the state. Um, in K-12, we have one state student information system that all school districts have to report student data through. 
Uh, we have one state CTE data system that's both for uh, post-secondary and secondary, so all data for CTEs in one system. We have uh, state-approved uh, course codes in the K-12 environment that have to be used, so they cannot just randomly offer classes in the schools. They have to offer approved uh, classes, and all those are coded. Uh, we have uh, state-approved career pathways, uh, so we're a locally controlled state, so the schools can offer whatever pathways they want, but in order to have pathways count for state accountability, for federal accountability, or for funding, they have to use the state-approved pathways that are made up of uh, those state-approved course codes that I just mentioned. And then career readiness indicators have been part of state accountability uh, since 2011-12. I think it was first put into the state accountability system in 10-11, but the data wasn't of the quality that we had in 11-12. And so I always quote 11-12 was the first year for career readiness indicators to be part of state accountability. But that's created a culture um, where uh, school districts, superintendents, uh, principals, everyone is um, very focused on getting students to career readiness, um, both for the sake of the accountability system, both federal and state, and for uh, just improving the lives of students after school. And so all of those things are in place. We have a lot of data in this state. We use data for everything. Um, I like to tell people that I don't like to make any statement unless I can back it up with numbers from KY stats that prove that what I'm saying is true. And so that was really important as we uh, moved forward with new skills for youth and allowed us to do a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about. Before I get into the actual work though, I wanted to tell you, show you uh, what we're capable of doing but also what the problem is that we really need to solve through new skills for youth, or at least get a start on through new skills for youth. So that's a quick screenshot of this uh, interactive system that KY Stats produces. It's what, um, it's 2010 high school graduates, and seven years later, what happened to those 2010 high school graduates? So we are able to see, did they go on to post-secondary? Did they get a job? Uh, how much are they making? What percentage are employed? Um, at the different levels of educational attainment, what do the different annual salaries look like? Um, all of that information is possible through KY stats, but this quick screenshot here shows you what the major problem is in the state. That is that we have um, about 73% of all of our high school graduates that go on to post-secondary institutions, whether that's a two or four year institution. Um, but only about 30% uh, of high school graduates actually earn something at the post-secondary level. So that's only 40% of the kids that go there and only 30% of all of our high school graduates overall. And so we have a lot of students that were going on to post-secondary education but weren't staying in post-secondary education, weren't succeeding, weren't earning anything. Um, and even worse, this doesn't show it, but if you could use the hoverovers, you'd be able to see that um, even amongst those that are earning those post-secondary credentials, only about three-fourths of those students actually get a job um, in the state. And so we have a huge college debt problem here. We're the fourth worst state in the nation for college loan defaults. Um, and so through New Skills for Youth, what we were trying to do is better prepare students for whatever was next after high school. And so all of the work that we are, I'm actually going to look at with you guys is all designed to fix the problem of students that um, graduate from high school and don't are not ready for what uh, came after high school. Too much of the focus in K-12 education has been to get students prepared to be successful in K-12 as opposed to how to get students to be uh, successful after K-12 is over. And so that's what we were trying to change through New Skills for Youth. So looking at a little bit of the work that we did, I'm not gonna be able to talk in depth about all of these things. Um, so I've underlined the three that I'm gonna talk about in depth. The others I'm going to um, quickly cover with you and just tell you what they were and why it was important for us. Um, <clears throat> we were really, really ambitious when we set out with New Skills for Youth. We set goals for um, having a higher percentage of our students complete career pathways, um, having a higher percentage of our teachers stay in CTE, having a higher percentage of our students get jobs in high demand, path in high demand jobs, uh, make sure all of our pathways were aligned to high demand jobs, make sure all of our pathways had a secondary to post-secondary connection, 
make sure that all of our pathways were true pathways, increase employer engagement, et cetera, et cetera. We had a lot of goals for new skills for youth, um, and we accomplished most of those goals, not everything, but most of those. Um, I wish I had time to talk about all of them, but I, I'll, I'll get into the one specifically here. Uh, the first one is we wanted to make sure that the pathways we offered in our schools were actually aligned to um, what our labor market information said and what the jobs of tomorrow are. And when we talk about the jobs of tomorrow, we look at um, five-year projected demand data. Um, so what are the jobs over the next five years that are going to be there in terms of um, uh, growth and replacement jobs? And so we wanted to make sure that all of our pathways were aligned to those top occupations. Uh, the next thing we wanted to, we, we just don't have enough resources in this state for everybody to do things by themselves. And so we really wanted to incentivize school districts, uh, post-secondary business and industry and our technical centers to work together, share resources and eliminate duplication of services to students um, because we just don't have enough resources for everyone to offer the exact same things. And that's unfortunately what was happening. In one area of the state, we had about four districts um, that we sat down with together. And amongst those four districts, they had 14 business teachers. And they were all offering the exact same pathways in those four districts with their 14 business teachers. And so what one of our big goals for this was, was to get those 14 teachers to each do different things and then to share those teachers amongst the four districts and get uh, students to be able to go to the different pathways at the different schools that were available as opposed to only having one option at each district because all the teachers were doing the same thing. Uh, one that I'm not gonna to get to talk about in depth as much as I want to, but is really important is making sure that the industry certifications that are part of federal and state accountability are of value. So they're not just a test so that a school can get a point in an accountability system, but that those industry recognized credentials meant something to the students earning those in terms of either college credit or um, more a higher likelihood of getting an interview or even higher salary um, once they received a job. And so we passed legislation in the state uh, to determine exactly how industry certifications uh, get on that approved list. Uh, and if anybody has questions about that, I'm happy to talk more about that later or provide you with uh, follow-up information if you needed that. Uh, we had a, only about 67% of our teachers were being retained in the CTE occupation-based area. So that's um, people coming directly from business and industry and teaching for us. Uh, only two-thirds of our teachers were being retained, um, and we had to then go in and change all of our regulations around bringing in uh, occupation-based teachers. We had to completely change our teacher induction model and our mentoring and um, support model for those teachers. Um, that, that has been uh, incredible success. We've gone from only 67% retention to over 90%, close to 95% retention of our teachers uh, through that new retention model. Um, we have an amazing program that we um, have gotten a lot of great feedback on over the three years that we've implemented it. And, Jody Adams, who manages all of that, uh, does a phenomenal job, and we've had a lot of states reach out to her. Um, if you would like to learn more about our teacher retention model, happy to share Jody's information with you on that. But uh, one of our huge goals was to retain our teachers, um, and I'm happy to say that with almost 95% retention rate, we're accomplishing that. Um, we wanted to tr create true career pathways here in the state. Uh, when I say true career pathways, before New Skills for Youth, we were mainly worried about making sure that our CTE courses uh, were combined in a intro level to advanced level sequence of classes and making sure that kids were taking uh, those classes in sequence. And so a four credit sequence of classes is what we used to call a career pathway. Through New Skills for Youth, we've expanded a career pathway definition to mean all of the gen ed classes along with the technical classes at both the secondary and post-secondary level that a student would need to go from ninth grade to a bachelor's degree or higher um, and laying that out in a career lattice um, on and off ramp kind of way so that they can see what courses 
they needed to truly be successful. Um, that really helped out a lot with our high school counselors. And I have some models I'll show you of that. But when I say true career pathway, a true career pathway is not just a bunch of CTE technical classes. It's all of the classes that are needed for a student to be successful in their chosen career area. Uh, the last thing that we focused a lot on in our grant um, was employer engagement. And so we traveled the state and partnered with locals, uh, local chambers of commerce and local workforce investment boards to have uh, employer engagement sessions where we brought in business and industry to sit down with our school system to learn how they can get involved. We had to really work hard on uh, making sure that we had definitions that both educators and business and industry understood. And then we had commitment cards for our business in industry uh, to say this is how we'd like to be involved with uh, the school in terms of uh, career pathways and work-based learning, et cetera. Um, in our career academies that I'm getting ready to talk about, uh, we through this model, we were able to bring on uh, 200 new employers partnering with just those 10 academies. Uh, this is not the only increased employer engagement we've had across the state, but that's just an example of the success we had with this uh, model um, travel in the state and putting these sessions together. All right, with that, I'm going to get really deep into the first uh, underlined area, which is the alignment of pathways to labor market data. Um, before we could align pathways to the most in demand occupations, we actually had to determine what the top occupations were and which ones we really wanted to incentivize. And so we sat down with uh, economic development. Chamber of Commerce, the Kentucky Community and Technical College System, Council on Post-Secondary Education, Business and Industry, uh, and the Department of Education and with the Kentucky Center for Statistics to look at data to determine what are the top sectors that we need to be uh, aligning to. Uh, from that, you can see the top five sectors here for the state of Kentucky. Uh, these sectors are defined as a sector that has a 35,000 plus average annual salary for all jobs within that sector and the most jobs over the next five years, most jobs projected over the next five years. We also looked at support sectors at the same time. Once we defined and determined what our top sectors were, we had to then look at what are the top jobs in those top sectors. And so we uh, pulled up our labor market data, determined based on five-year projected openings, what are the top jobs in each of those sectors. Uh, we did the same thing for our support sectors, even though they're not showing here. These, this is just showing our top five sectors. Uh, from that, we then had to look at the pathways we offered in the state and how they align. So this is just a quick schematic of what we did. So we defined advanced manufacturing as a top five sector. We looked at the jobs underneath of that, welders being one of those, and then we aligned that job to the pathways that taught the standards and the skills needed to become a welder. And so uh, one misconception and something we had to overcome was that uh, some of our uh, program areas in the education world did not see themselves in the top five sectors, uh, agriculture being one of those. If you look at our top five sectors, one of those is not agriculture. Um, and we have a huge agriculture community here in the state. And they were worried that we were advocating to get rid of all of their programs. When in fact, all we were saying is that we needed to make sure that the programs we offered were well aligned to the jobs that are out there. So in Ag Power, they teach welding. Uh, they offer the AWS industry certification in the Ag Power pathway, which is a welding certification. Um, and so Ag Power, while it's not a, it's not part, while agriculture is not a top sector, the Ag Power pathway under agriculture aligns well with our. Um, with a job in the advanced manufacturing and in our construction area. And so we worked really hard to make sure that the pathways that we had were all aligned uh, to jobs. And when we got done with that, initially we found out that we had 50, over 50 pathways that were not aligned to top occupations. So we had to travel the state explaining to administrators, superintendents, principals, um, C CTE people that um, there was a need to make sure that what we offered in our schools really aligned to occupations um, and that we were going to start a two-year phase out of all pathways that did not align to top occupations and that any of those pathways that they continue to offer would not count for state funding, state accountability or federal or accountability or funding. 
so that was really tough, but we traveled the entire state and met with superintendents across the entire state and regional sessions, allowed them to uh, give feedback and talk with, uh, through all of this with us. Luckily, uh, people understood that based on the problems that we have in the state and the fact that kids are not getting jobs and are not completing post-secondary education, there was a need to make sure that we were in alignment with the actual jobs that were out there. And so uh, we didn't get the kinds of uh, pushback that a lot of people would have thought that we would have received. Um, we did leave the option there that if they could prove that there was a local need that did not show up in our um, in our labor market data that we they could uh, file to continue to offer or or even create new pathways uh, for those local needs, but they do have to do that based on data. All right, with that, I just want to show you a quick screenshot of a system we created using the labor market data. Uh, it looks like a conglomeration of a whole bunch of arrows, but what it really shows is um, all of the jobs and the projections over the next five years, the average annual wages that, um, or median wages that those jobs can expect, the growth in those jobs, the size of the arrow determines or tells you how big that um, big that job market is. This, the direction tells you how fast growing it is. You can zoom in on any of this. There's all kinds of drop downs that allow you to play with this data. You can uh, use the system to only look at one area of the state that you live in. But this really allows school districts to do the kinds of um, asset mapping that I'm getting ready to talk about. But this system right here was really important to us to help schools um, better align what they're offering in their schools to the labor market data that's out there. Um, I'm going to switch gears to the uh, sharing of resources. So this is just a quick map to show you. Um, we did 10 pilot uh, mini grants over the three years of New Skills for Youth, getting two or more school districts, a technical center, and at least one post-secondary institution and at least two business and industry partners in each of the top five sectors that were offered um, in that area of the state uh, to partner together to share resources. So these are the 10 areas of the state. So you can see we went from far western Kentucky to eastern Kentucky to north, south, and central. We had pilots across the entire state. Um, but this was a huge goal of New Skills for Youth for us was to share these resources and to create these pilots to see if we could get school districts to start to share resources with the limited resources we have. Uh, just a very quick, in those 10 academies that represents 32 school districts, 13 centers, both local or state operated, uh, over 200 new business and industry partners and 13 post-secondary institutions all working together to share resources and to offer pathways to students. Um, this is just a schematic that we use when we sat down with all of these partners to talk about the need for all of these groups to work together um, in the in the asset mapping process. And when we talk about asset mapping, uh, we're not just talking about what pathways they offer, but we're trying to get them to understand uh, that they need to offer the right pathways. They need to look at what facilities and equipment they have in the area. They need to look at who their personnel is. They need to look at the funding that's available and then the community resources that are available. So we walk them through an asset mapping process in each of these five areas. I'm just gonna show you one of those asset ma mapping processes and that's for the pathways. So what we did is we brought everyone together in each of these 10 areas, sat down with them. We had already pulled all of the pathways that they offered in all of the different institutions that were partnering together we pulled all of their labor market data for their area of the state, and we had them crosswalk what they offered to what was needed in their area of the state to find duplication, uh, oversaturation, gaps in delivery, and where they could partner together to support um, local needs. And then at the end of which, create an analysis and a five-year plan for how they were going to uh, offer those new pathways or phase out the ones that are really not um, leading to those occupations that are needed in that area of the state. This was a lot of handholding folks and this is not easy work and um, some of my parting comments are going to be about the fact that the state had to support them by pulling them together and walking them through all of these processes in order for this to happen. Uh, when I talked earlier about uh, true career pathways, this is 
what we call a true career pathway in the state. And we have three models for each of these pathways. Uh, so this is a partnership between uh, KCTCS, our community college system, uh, Northern Kentucky University, a four-year partner, and a K-12, our K-12 institutions. This is a real pathway that's offered and it outlines exactly what, what courses are needed at each level of this and what are the dual credit opportunities that are available from these institutions all along the way and at what grade level they can be taken. So when I say that there's three models of this, um, people freak out when they see this for the first time because it has so much dual credit happening at the ninth and 10th and 11th grade uh, levels. This is possible in the state. Um, during New Skills for Youth, we passed two pieces of legislation to provide free dual credit uh, to students. Uh, one of those dual credit scholarships uh, allows two CTE classes to be taken um, at each grade level of high school for free. And so this, this model that I'm showing right here um, takes full advantage of all of the scholarships uh, that are available to, to these students. Um, but it's a very advanced model. So we have another one where dual credit doesn't begin until the 11th grade level. Um, and then we have a third model where they're not doing any dual credit at all. And so what we're trying to do is get high school counselors to understand that all students are different. Some students are very advanced and are ready for this at the ninth grade level. Some are not ready to take dual credit until the 11th grade. And some students are not ready for college classes until they get to college. But all three models are possible and all three have a um, roadmap to get there. And so we laid out the exact classes that are needed at each level. So very quickly, this one shows um, how the student can um, basically be taking nothing but college classes in 12th grade. They'd have their associate's degree um, at one year into uh, community college and two years later, they would have their bachelor's degree um, all of these classes do transfer. That was one of the things we did with these true pathways is to make sure that uh, each institution would accept the classes from the prior institution to make sure that there was a seamless, a true seamless pathway from level to level and including um, both the academic and the CTE classes that are needed at each level. Uh, we passed new grad requirements uh, during new skills for youth as well, which allows personalization of classes. Um, and takes away some of the uh, absolutely required classes. Um, in prior to this, Algebra 2 was required for every student. Uh, after our new grad requirements, Algebra 2 does not have to be taken. It needs to be a personalized uh, math course based on what the student's uh, post high school career goals are. And, but as you can see in this example, Algebra 2 is absolutely required if you want to go into computer science. And so we wanted to make that apparent to people because one of the big pushbacks we got on this was that uh, we were preaching that upper level math classes were no longer needed for students um, in career pathways, which is uh, falsity. It's just that the same math class is not needed for every single pathway in the state. Um, if you're going to be a welder, typically you need a um, post-secondary technical math class as opposed to an algebra two or a college algebra class. And so these pathways just lay out um, each, each one of those in a true uh, sequence of classes for students. And as you can see, there's on and off ramps throughout this. So they could have stopped um, and had their certificates after uh, 12th grade, but they also go on and get their associate's degree in this case, or they could go on and get their bachelor's degree depending on what the post-secondary aspirations were for each student. And I'm out of time here, so I'm gonna very quickly give you my final thoughts on some of this work um, because I, I quickly went through this, but without the partnerships we had between our school districts, our post-secondary institutions, our business and industry, and our organizations like the Chamber of Commerce and Economic Development, this, this work is just not possible. Firstly, we had to all agree on using the single data source for labor market information, which was really tough. Um, but until you do that, it's really hard to align pathways to labor market data if everybody's using different data. Uh, like I said, while we're a locally controlled state, in order to count in state accountability or to use um, any of our state funding, you had to offer the pathways and the courses that we approve at the state level. Uh, we were able to back up through the Kentucky Center for Statistics all of the statements and all of the work that we did through data to show outcomes for students. Um, just a very quick data point. 
uh, uh, career pathway completers uh, earn degrees at a higher rate, they make more than non-career pathway completers, and they're employed at a higher rate in this state than non-career pathway completers, and that's really important when trying to get people to switch to uh, this career pathway model. Uh, we really had to sell and market this by traveling the state to talk individually with superintendents and building principals. Uh, this work takes a ton of time um, and it requires a lot of handholding. In our largest school district, we actually ripped out all of the pathways in all of their schools and started over from scratch. Um, and that's taking um, four years of work in order to make that happen. Um, but we did have to start over from scratch because they were not offering pathways that were aligned. Um, and then we are continuing this work by requiring all of the things that I just talked about to be part of uh, the Perkins local needs assessments that are turned into the state in order to get Perkins funding. With that, I've talked a ton very quickly. I apologize. Um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer those um, at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Kylie. It was really great to hear how data-driven all of Kentucky's work was, and I think that's a really good example for other states. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Carrie so that she can talk about the work that Massachusetts did under the New Skills for Youth initiative. Thank you so much, Brianna, and you're going to help me with the slides? Yes. Okay. So I'm Carrie Occasion. Um, thank you for listening and being on the webinar today. I'm the Career Development Education Lead for the state. Um, I focus on um, elementary and secondary. Um, I also work on connecting activities, encouraging employer participation, encouraging new programming, investments in new programming, supporting pathways, and also developing content on career development education to be shared with the field. Um, I just, oh, can you, Brianna, next slide. I just want to take a moment to thank NSFY so much for their support and their thought leadership. We had the, the outcomes were so beneficial. I actually came onto this project in April of this year, so I'm at the tail end of it. We've had some um, staffing changes, so I've learned a lot pretty quickly, but my state has done some wonderful work, and so, yeah. Um, next slide. I'm trying to go quickly. Um, so the key content takeaways, um, the state context. Um, some helpful information to better understand the approach that Massachusetts is taking to deliver high quality and career readiness activity, some of the challenges encountered in doing this work and some of the solutions that helped us along the way, um, and some recommendations and ideas. Also, I can be reached via email or telephone if we don't have time to get to, question, to all of our questions. Um, so yeah, slide four. Um, so to better understand Massachusetts and their approach to college and career readiness, um, some of our background knowledge might be helpful to understand. So people over the age of 65 are leaving the workforce in droves, and we don't have enough qualified workers to fill the roles. Since 2008, there's been a steady decline in the number of high school graduates. And since 2012, there's been a significant drop in college enrollment. And it's also anticipated that there's a 25% loss of people obtaining degrees after 2025. Um, also in Massachusetts, not only do we not have as many students completing um, college, the number of disengaged students is highly reported. Um, students are reporting that they're not engaged in school or excited about the future, so we have quite a few challenges. Um, we're at a point where we need to, needed to really focus on training students to fill these roles that um, will be opening. So, um, Slide five. Some of the challenges um, that we encountered were that our efforts across multiple agencies were definitely not streamlined. We also had lack of consistency in what makes the pathway high quality. So there was not a lot of consistency in service across the state. And our strategies for college and career advising were um, definitely underdeveloped. Okay. So through the work of NSFY, slide six, um, we began to do cross-agency work and we were really, we were extremely lucky um, that college career readiness became our governor's priority. Uh, we developed 
the Massachusetts Workforce Skills Cabinet that aligns the executive offices of education, labor and workforce development, and housing and economic development toward a comprehensive growth agenda. And the cabinet was charged with creating and implementing strategies to ensure that um, that individuals can develop and continuously improve upon their, their skills and knowledge to meet the hiring needs of employers across Massachusetts. A major gain from the workforce skills cabinet work um, were the development of seven labor market blueprints, which identified the economic priorities and critical skills gaps um, across the state. Um, and they're fascinating and they're, um, I find them fascinating, uh, but they're online. Um, they just bring up so much information, especially like transportation and um, issues in certain areas and just small changes that can be tweaked to really get people where they're supposed to be. Um, the template, a template is available online and I can send that um, to kind of follow our blueprint if other states are interested in doing this work. So now all of our work is based on these labor market blueprints. People were trying to encourage our workforce boards to, you know, make partnerships using labor market research. So it's basically they're just used for um, for all of our work now. Um, we also some of our work through NSFY was to develop criteria for high quality college and career pathways. Um, so we identified five guiding principles for our pathways because our, before this, we did not have guiding principles um, to go by. So a lot of our pathways did not, there was not a lot of consistency across the state. So equitable access and you, so districts can apply for designations um, and they have to reach these five criteria. So equitable access, um, pathways should prioritize, that's guiding principle one, they should prioritize students from un underrepresented in education, enrollment, and completion. It should be structured to eliminate barriers to student participation. So some examples, they can include tuition-free participation, open enrollment without regard to prior academic performance, and student support to promote success, also multiple entry points. Um, guiding principle two, guided academic pathways, the pathway program should be structured around clear and detailed student academic pathways with regard to coursework, sequencing, and experiences beyond the classroom. They should offer students substantive, substantive, substantive exposure to career opportunities in high demand fields, allowing them to make informed decisions about which career pathway to pursue. And the, the guided academic pathway should also be um, authentic um, and academically rigorous. Guiding principle three, act, um, enhance student support. You should incorporate enough wraparound services to promote academic success. Also a connection to career, guiding principle four. Um, so opportunities for targeted workforce and career skill development, career counseling and elements of experiential and work-based learning. And then expected partnerships. Um, so to, obtain the designation as a high quality um, pathway, um, the pathway applicants would have to demonstrate how they are partnering with mass hire boards, which are workforce boards or institutes of higher education. Um, and there's, some, there's so many lessons learned. One thing is to provide schools with concrete examples of guiding principles and, and in action and actually what equitable access looks like because we were finding out that um, a lot of our schools don't really know what that means. And so we, we're now still doing this work and providing technical assistance in those areas. Um, we also developed a statewide um, college career advising system using insight from labor market research. We placed a school-wide focus on advising and we stopped just focusing on guidance counselors. So. So the onus was on everyone to kind of take responsibility for this work. Um, we also developed through the NSFY work, um, MyCap, My Career and Academic Plan. And it's a process of self-discovery um, for students and it's also an instrument. It serves as an e-portfolio and captures learning and artifacts that demonstrate success. Um, so 
there's so many lessons learned once again, but for this, um, the importance of messaging and acronyms, um, you know, we had HQCCP for high quality college and career pathways, and a lot of people call it like pickup now. We have MICAP, we just have so many acronyms and our, we've just gotten so much feedback about the confusion and messaging. So we're really working on that. And one resource that I find really helpful is um, from the Reform Support Network. It's a framework for communication and engagement uh, for state educational agencies. And they say to involve, inquire, involve people in the state to inquire, ask, continuously ask people questions to improve quality of programming and policies, to inform, um, to be deliberate, deliberate in the information that we share, and to inspire uh, people to act on our behalf as ambassadors for this work. To really get stakeholders invested. Um, so yeah, those were the lessons learned. That's it, right, Brianna? Yeah. Thank you, Terry. It's really great to hear the intentionality that Massachusetts took to ensure that there was that systems alignment um, and those cross-sector meetings. So now we're going to move on to the Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to either put them in the chat or um, type them in the chat or type them in the Q&A um, box. Um, I see a question for Kylie. Um, the question is, what source did your stakeholders agree on for job inf information? So all of our groups came together and agreed, and it was put into legislation that we would use the Kentucky Center for Statistics labor market data. Um, they actually are the home of labor market data for the state of Kentucky now as part of New Skills for Youth. They, um, they took over that work for the state. And so we do not use outside vendors. Uh, we do not use burning glass. We use uh, real Kentucky data that's designed um, and developed by the Kentucky Center for Statistics. It sounds like you guys use a, a myriad of data services. Um, and so, Carrie, there's a question for you. Um, it's a clarifying question. What was the communication tool that you mentioned? Carrie, it looks like you might be muted. I was muted. I apologize. So it is the four eyes from the reform support network and it's a communications and engagement tool. I can send a link to you, Brianna, if you can send it out. Um, but you sure. can get that by Googling it, reform support network, communications and engagement tool, and the four eyes. Like Great. I, Thank you. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I have a letter in the alphabet. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so a question that I have for both of you is, given the reauthorization of Perkins, how do you plan to leverage Perkins to help you sustain the work that you accomplish under the new Skills for Youth initiative? Uh, so we use, um, in Kentucky, sorry, uh, we use the new Skills for Youth as a pilot for all the work that we wanted to see if it would work, to see if we could do it. Um, and then we are uh, taking all of the lessons learned through New Skills for Youth and embedding that actually into our Perkins plan and um, incorporating everything that we did through New Skills for Youth into our Perkins um, state approved plan. Uh, a couple examples, sorry, a couple examples of that are um, with the local needs assessment, they have to do, they have to partner together now. Um, so during New Skills for Youth, it was optional and they could apply for a mini grant to partner together. As part of Perkins, they have no choice but to now partner together um, because we've seen such success through New Skills for Youth and the partnerships that have happened there uh, that we felt like they needed to do that statewide. And so all local needs assessments have to be done um, through a, a full partnership between post-secondary business and industry and multiple school districts. So that's just one of the lessons uh, learned and one of the things we've incorporated. We're also using Perkins Reserve dollars to uh, continue to 
uh, incentivize the creation of uh, career academies. So I didn't get to talk a lot about that, but uh, we are going to continue that work through our Perkins Reserve Funds. Um, and then we're also using Perkins Reserve Funds to do a lot around work-based learning, which I didn't talk about at all, but uh, we did a lot around work-based learning um, as part of New Skills for Youth as well. We tried to embed everything we learned through New Skills for Youth and all of the work that we did there through pilots into our actual Perkins uh, state application. Okay. Am I, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry. So, yeah, um, basically ditto to a lot of the things that Kylie, uh, Kylie just said. Um, we did use NSFY as a pilot to really um, um, develop our practices, tighten up our practices, and really see where we're going to go and, and because of the flexibility of Perkins, just some areas um, that we're going to use that funding for is to enhance the designation process, offering technical assistance to schools. Um, we're also going to expand our offerings to comprehensive schools as well, um, not just so focused on um, career and technical education schools, but also um, comprehensive and academic schools. Great, so it sounds like both of you leverage new skills for youth to create that proof of concept so that you um, had the evidence that you needed to justify using your Perkins plan to sustain this work. Um, well, thank you both of you for taking the time to be on this webinar. Um, a question that I saw come through the chat box is if the recording of this webinar and the slides would be available online, they will be within the next few business days if you go to Advanced CTE's website and then click on the, I believe it's the News and Events tab, and then select Webinars. You should be able to scroll down and find um, the slides and recording from this webinar. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I also put um, Kylie and Carrie's emails on the slide um, so that you all could reach out. Um, so thank you, Kylie and Carrie. This is incredibly helpful to hear um, the lessons learned, and I'm sure it was helpful for other states. And again, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.